Did I do it? Did I match it? Did I walk right? <laughs> this is such a happy little kid. This is the most authentic, in their element. This is such an incredibly happy kid. And you can imagine, this is 1980, deep inside apartheid. Television is about three years old in the country. And this kid, assigned female at birth, does not identify with any of it, gets to play a boy role on television. You can imagine. And they were so clever. They understood that when they arrive on set in a skirt, they get pushed into a corner and they must sit there, shut up, and find a way to occupy themselves. But when they arrive on set in pants, this kid can play, this kid can explore, this kid can do whatever it is that they want without being reprimanded. So they already knew that there was something, there was some game that was going on, you know? Nana, where's your twin? Oh, she's at home. Ah, Nana, how's your twin? Oh, he's fine. Because there can only be two, there must be two, there can't be one, right? So they started to play this game because they knew that there were roles to be played and that was not just on the set. And so the kid started to lie. But why? Why? So I grew up in a maternal home. I grew up with my grandmother, Mama, was the pillar of our home. Uh, Mama had her sisters, Nkunu Katie and Nkunu Dudu. And there was my mom we called Pando and my little sister, Debo. And everybody did everything. Everybody did everything. There's nothing that we did not know how to do in this household. It was a very busy household all the time. And we had grand, my grandfather, who we called De, who it turns out was not my grandfather, but my grandmother's boyfriend, um, after Ntatedizi, who we will park in a corner for now. Um, <laughs> My grandfather, Dare, was absolutely amazing. In fact, he is that guy that would bring broken toys. He brought all these paint brushes. He brought all these books for us. Um, and he had this little, um, his, his armchair in the corner that was red and black, and that's where he sat. And he did absolutely nothing but just sat there. And I remember my grandmother saying, you know, I'm so, I'm so grateful for Ndatendlo Vude because, you know, he brings such dignity to our home because, you know, a home without a man has no dignity. And I remember thinking, Mara Mama, you are the pillar in this home, you know? Like the whole community depends on you. Everyone comes to you for everything, whether it's shelter, for food. It doesn't matter, even just for a little bit of advice. So how is it? <laughs> What's going on? But of course, there was no answer for me, right? And so the question started building. And so my mom had this love interest, Abu Tiselbi, who came from the northwest province of the country. And we were told that he was going to come visit one day. And we were all excited to meet Abu Tiselbi. And my sister and I were told, wear your dresses, behave, because he's a strict traditional man. So Dewa and I looked at each other like, yeah. <laughs> What's going to happen now? And so on this winter day, Abdi Selby now is supposed to arrive. It's a Saturday. It's supposed to be lunchtime. And oh, everybody got busy. And I saw, you know, I mean, it was winter. You know Joburg winters? The sun is like shining through, but it never penetrates through the four-room concrete home. And so fire, the fire had to be done. I remember seeing Mama going out and chopping wood. Uh, Bando, my mom, climbing the roof because she had to fix the chimney and, and, and make sure that, you know, you're not smoking out of Diselbi in the process, you know. <laughs> I had my garden shears because mama had taught me how to do the lawn and I was trimming and making sure that the lawn was neat. It was almost, always my job to do the lawn, you know. And I remember Nkhunu Dudu with like a pliers in her hands and like a screwdriver and she was fixing, fixing a light fixture. Meanwhile, the food is cooking, smelling really divine in the house. Abuti Selby rocks up in this big truck. Turns out that he was a trucker. And he was a big man too, so like blotting the sun between him and his truck. <laughs> Walks into our home. And before he even sits down, my mom goes, Hey, Selby, yo, look at this plug. Please could you fix it for us? Because we're just women in this house. We don't know how to do these things. Little me. Ha, ma, mara, mus. 
that look. We don't get reprimanded, you know that. We get a look. And so I knew, okay. <laughs> but hey, the questions are building now. I can't wait, right? Because also I'm noticing that there's like a whole funny behavior happening in the household. Like the women in the house are like, <laughs> and they're like making themselves all a bit weak and minimizing themselves. And Abuti Selby is feeling good, man. I was like, ah, hey, this is how it works. I couldn't wait for Abuti Selby to leave so I can ask. And so, of course, he, he leaves. I'm like, Ma, hi, how did you lie like that? What's going on? And the first thing my mom said, one day you will grow up and you will understand. Yeah, I couldn't wait to grow up. I remember Nkhonu Katie, who apparently, while I was growing up, I found out that, you know, she didn't have a boyfriend, she never had any interests in, in, in boys, in men. She said, ah, we were all tomboys once. You will grow up. You will understand. And Mama said, how? Oh, you what do they teach you there in that Catholic school? Sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus, what a wonder you are. You are brighter than the morning star. You are fairer, much fairer than the lily that grows by the way. Don't get me wrong. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. This is the one guy in the Bible that I truly get, right? That I really, truly understand. But so much is confusing. For, I mean... I couldn't even tell my grandmother that, hey, even Sister Geraldine and all the other nuns were sick and tired of my questions. I mean, surely Catholic school is the best place to ask who is God, right? And I mean, it's not a strange question, is it? And so me, I ask, who is God? Hey, eventually Sister Geraldine tells me, well, he is this white guy that sits in the sky and he judges and he, he makes sure you must be a good girl. And then I find out that, oh, he also made this guy called Adam. And then Eve was made out of a rib. And then Eve ate an apple. And now we are all sinners. <laughs> but, but what's worse is, you girls in the class, you are the chief sinners. Because you are like Eve, so you must suffer. I was like, Mara Sister Geraldine, shut up, Bev. And so I continued to ask questions, and nobody had any answers for me. And the confusion grew. But as I grew up, I realized two very key things. One of them was that I was never going to understand enough, because I was never going to ever, like a boy, enough to want to minimize myself and to change who I am in order for them to like me. I also realized that I was never going to fit into these two genders that they're trying to fit me into. And in all that confusion, this guy comes along. I mean, look at, like, I was like, this is me, Moss. I mean, George Allen O'Dowd, assigned male at birth. How gorgeous is he? How, is, how impeccable is that makeup? I was like, oh my God, somebody else out there is like me. And then he used the word gay to identify himself. Oh my goodness, what a wonderful word. I have never been so happy to find a word. I found home in the word gay, and I brought that word home. And that's what happened. I mean, look at you, you're a black gay activist. I mean, this is, it's like, we're talking about way different, okay? Way different. And I used to beat up gays, you know, because as far as I'm concerned, they don't belong on earth, you know. They're wrong. They're naturally screwed up. Mm. Okay. I hear this all the time. Memam Gwena, my grandmother's best friend, who was a nurse in a psychiatric um, clinic when I was growing up, said, yeah, we've heard of, like, mental issues like this. All you've got to do, actually, is just get married, make some children, and you'll be fine. Nkonu Katie, you remember? She said, oh, we were, we were tomboys. Yeah, she said, why do you have to name yourself? You can be like Mimos, not say anything. How? I was told, all you have to do is fulfill your duties as a woman, and then everything else will be fine. And I said, but why? For whom? Who does it serve for me to lie? Because it's certainly not you, ma. 
It's not you, Honu Katie. It's not me. So who does it serve? And then I realize, wait, we are living a lie. But not only are we living a lie, we are living in reaction to a lie. There's a system in place that's telling us all these things. For example, that there are only two genders. I am sorry, my great-great-grandmother, Nkunu Mantadizi, before she passed on, used to tell me all the time, she was in her 90s, used to tell me all the time that there has always been people like you. Some more visibly different and some not. But even doctors have the license to mutilate children to make them either one or the other. The system tells us things like, a girl can only love a boy, and a boy can only love a girl, but we all know. We know this instinctively. Those of us who have never experienced it does not mean there are those of us who have not experienced that there are all kinds of love. But there's a system in place to make sure that, oh no, we must sit in this place, right? Oh, and my favorite one. Here's my favorite one. Men are superior to women. Okay, so besides the fact that there is no scientific nothing, Nothing, no proof to this madness. We know inherently, we know instinctively, Mother Earth is the giver of all life. In fact, Satu said it even best, that our very existence begins in the body of a woman. So why are we so happy to celebrate our, our, our lies? Who am I going to Oh, to go Oh, si pege la si pege le, oh si wele le si wele le si avuma. Ah, come on! Even Magoti is celebrating her own subjugation. That's how we are eating this lie. We are so happy with this lie. <laughs> so, what would happen if we just said no to all of it? What would happen if we just said, no, I refuse to live a lie? Yeah. I really think that we could change systems. I mean, I think that my grandma would not have been as brutalized as she was, and maybe would not have even stayed in that marriage to that Diddy. Do you remember we parked in? Who terrorized my grandmother and my mother, terrorized them. That probably would not have happened. But even further, would my grandfather and Tatiditi have been a monster if he had been allowed to be a feeling, sensitive human being who's not dehumanized by a system that demands that he not be a human being? What about the wars? I mean, look at all these wars. All this, I'm bigger than you, I'm better than you, I'm going to take your country, I'm going to take your this, I'm going to take your that. Would that even be there? What about our mother, our earth, that's being blasted and drilled to smithereens? I really honestly believe that none of these things would be there. What about the stories we are told? What about the stories we tell? Would we be telling different stories from a different point of view? Would we, for example, know that there was a Lilith before a Eve? Yes. Would we, for example, know about o General Mkabai Kajam, without whom there would have been no shark? I remember actually one historian saying, oh yeah, she died very lonely death because she had no husband and no children. Honey, I have no husband, I have no children, I am so far from lonely. <laughs> but no, we would not know these stories and many, many more. We will not know them because the system depends on a lie. The system itself is a lie that thrives on lies. That's what the system is. And without the system, this kid here, would not have spent 40 years of their lives being told that people like them do not exist. This kid would not have spent all these years being denigrated, being abused, being spat at, being physically assaulted, being invisibilized. In fact, the kid, this kid and all the little kids like them, of all genders, of all races, of all orientations, all socioeconomic backgrounds, would have been allowed to live and thrive as full human beings, whether in a skirt or pants, had it not been for the system. Well, I am this kid, 50 years old, and I refuse to live a lie. And my creator, 
my maker is a wonderful creator. A creator who is a spirit, who is neither a gender or a race, who lives in us, who lives around us, who lives in every living thing, who only wants one thing from us, to live with joy, to live as our authentic selves, to love. That's all. But how can we be our authentic selves when all we do is lie? So isn't it time to stop the lies? Yes. 